Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English A, and our objective now for the hour is to finish with our conversation regarding Milton and more particularly Paradise Lost. Our, our ambitions are uh, 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 to at least spend a few seconds uh, looking at the opening lines of Paradise Lost. For your notes, I recommend the following as a schemata. Uh, we mentioned the theodistic question yesterday. Now what I will recommend to you is that you pay particular attention to this one character of Paradise Lost, namely Lucifer, Satan. And Satan, in, in Milton's myth, is thrown out of heaven. He then will decide to wage war against God, and the way he will do it is by trying to corrupt humans. Okay? Now, one of the penultimate questions, almost as good as, is it better to be feared or to be loved? Uh, one of the penultimate questions is this question. Is it better to have experience or to be innocent? And you'll remember back the last semester when we did Blake's, at the very beginning of our semester, Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience, and we were asking that question. Uh, that's, that's one of the intriguing questions. And then back to the Romantic period one more time, Mary Shelley writes Frankenstein about Dr. Frankenstein, who creates this monster who's hideous. Dr. Frankenstein abandons his monster. His monster is then jettisoned out into the wilderness where he runs into a family who teaches him how to read where he learns how to read reading Paradise Lost. Shelley was not without a sense of irony, you see. The question is, is it better to live in Eden, where it's perfect, but you don't know anything, you're ignorant, or is it better to have knowledge, even though that knowledge can lead to negative implications? This is one of the penultimate questions of Paradise Lost. All right, here we go. We'll now listen. Just follow along. This is the reading of Paradise Lost. Lost. John Milton. You are about to read a selection from the beginning of Paradise Lost by John Milton. Satan and his follower Beelzebub have been cast into hell after a failed revolt against God. Read along to learn how Satan responds to his downfall. Of man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world, and all our woes with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed Moses. in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or if Sion Hill delight thee more, and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian Mount, while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O Spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me, for thou knowest. Thou from the first wast present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like sat brooding on the vast abyss, and made it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine, what is low, raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence, and justify the ways of God to men. The Odyssey. Say first, for heaven hides nothing from thy view, nor the deep tract of hell. Say first what cause moved our grandparents, in that happy state, favoured of heaven so highly, to fall off from their creator, and transgress his will for one restraint, lords of the world besides. Who first seduced them to that foul revolt? the infernal serpent. He it was, whose guile, stirred up with envy and revenge, deceived the mother of mankind, what time his pride had cast him out from heaven with all his host of rebel angels, by whose aid, aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers, he trusted to have equaled the most high if he opposed. 
and with ambitious aim against the throne and monarchy of God, raised impious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt. Him, the almighty power hurled headlong, flaming from the ethereal sky, with hideous ruin and combustion down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire, who durst defy the omnipotent to arms. Nine times the space that measures day and night to mortal men, he with his horrid crew lay vanquished, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded though immortal. But his doom reserved him to more wrath, for now the thought both of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him. Round he throws his baleful eyes that witnessed huge affliction and dismay, mixed with obdurate pride and steadfast hate. At once, as far as angels ken, he views the dismal situation waste and wild, a dungeon horrible, on all sides round as one great furnace flamed. Yet from those flames, no light but rather darkness visible served only to discover sights of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades, where peace and rest can never dwell. Hope never comes that comes to all, but torture without end still urges, and a fiery deluge fed with ever-burning sulphur unconsumed. Such place eternal justice had prepared for those rebellious. Here their prison ordained in utter darkness and their portion set as far removed from God and light of heaven as from the center thrice to the utmost pole. Oh, how unlike the place from whence they fell. There the companions of his fall, o'erwhelmed with floods and whirlwinds of tempestuous fire, he soon discerns. And, weltering by his side, one next himself in power, and next in crime, long after known in Palestine and named Beelzebub, to whom the archenemy, and thence in heaven called Satan, with bold words breaking the horrid silence, thus began. If thou beest he, but oh, how fallen! How changed from him who in the happy realms of light, clothed with transcendent brightness, didst outshine myriads though bright. If he, whom mutual league, united thoughts and counsels, equal hope and hazard in the glorious enterprise, joined with me once, now misery hath joined in equal ruin. Into what pit thou seest, from what height fallen? So much the stronger proved he with his thunder. And till then, who knew the force of those dire arms? Yet, not for those, nor what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change, though changed in outward luster, that fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injured merit that with the mightiest raised me to contend and to the fierce contention brought along innumerable force of spirits armed that durst dislike his reign and me preferring his utmost power with adverse power opposed in dubious battle on the plains of heaven and shook his throne. What though the field be lost? All is not lost. The unconquerable will and study of revenge, immortal hate and courage never to submit or yield, and what is else not to be overcome? That glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me. To bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee, and deify his power whom from the terror of 
this arm so late doubted his empire, that were low indeed. That were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall. Since, by fate, the strength of gods and this imperial substance cannot fail, since, through experience of this great event, in arms not worse, in foresight much advanced, we may, with more successful hope, resolve to wage by force or guile eternal war, irreconcilable to our grand foe, who now triumphs, and in the excess of joy, soul reigning, holds the tyranny of heaven. So spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. And him thus answered soon his bold compeer. O prince, O chief of many throned powers, that led the embattled seraphim to war under thy conduct, and in dreadful deeds fearless endangered heaven's perpetual king, and put to proof his high supremacy, whether upheld by strength, or chance, or fate. Too well I see and rue the dire event that with sad overthrow and foul defeat hath lost us heaven, and all this mighty host in horrible destruction laid thus low, as far as gods and heavenly essences can perish. For the mind and spirit remains invincible, and vigour soon returns, though all our glory extinct, and happy state here swallowed up in endless misery. But what if he, our conqueror, whom I now of force believe almighty, since no less than such could have o'erpowered such force as ours, have left us this our spirit and strength entire, strongly to suffer and support our pains, that we may so suffice his vengeful ire, or do him mightier service, as his thralls by right of war, whate'er his business be, here in the heart of hell to work in fire, or do his errands in the gloomy deep. What can it then avail, though yet we feel strength undiminished? or eternal being, to undergo eternal punishment. Whereto, with speedy words, the arch-fiend replied, Fallen cherub, to be weak is miserable, doing or suffering. But of this be sure, to do aught good never will be our task, but ever to do ill our sole delight as being the contrary to his high will whom we resist. If then his providence out of our evil seek to bring forth good, our labour must be to pervert that end, and out of good still to find means of evil, which oft times may succeed, so as perhaps shall grieve him if I fail not, and disturb his inmost counsels from their destined aim. But see, the angry victor hath recalled his ministers of vengeance and pursuit back to the gates of heaven. The sulphurous hail, shot after us in storm, o'erblown hath laid the fiery surge that from the precipice of heaven received us falling, and the thunder, winged with red lightning and impetuous rage, perhaps hath spent his shafts, and ceases now to bellow through the vast and boundless deep. Let us not slip the occasion, whether scorn or satiate fury yielded from our foe. Seest thou yon dreary plain, forlorn and wild, the seat of desolation, Void of light, save what the glimmering of these livid flames casts, pale and dreadful. Thither let us tend from off the tossing of these fiery waves. There rest, if any rest can harbour there. 
and reassembling our afflicted powers, consult how we may henceforth most offend our enemy, our own loss, how repair, how overcome this dire calamity, what reinforcement we may gain from hope, if not, what resolution from despair. Thus, Satan, talking to his nearest mate, with head uplift above the wave, and eyes that sparkling blazed, his other parts besides, prone on the flood, extended long and large, lay floating many a rood, in bulk as huge as whom the fables name of monstrous size, Titanian or earthborn, that warred on Jove, Briarius or Typhon, whom the den by ancient Tarsus held, or that sea beast Leviathan, which God of all his works created hugest that swim the ocean stream. Him, haply, slumbering on the Norway foam, the pilot of some small night-founded skiff, deeming some island, oft, as seamen tell, with fixed anchor in his scaly rind, moors by his side under the lee, while night invests the sea, and wish it morn delays. So stretched out, huge in length, the arch-fiend lay, chained on the burning lake. Nor ever thence had risen or heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs. But with reiterated crimes he might heap on himself damnation while he sought evil to others and enraged might see how all his malice served but to bring forth infinite goodness, grace, and mercy shown on man by him seduced, but on himself treble confusion, wrath, and vengeance poured. Forthwith upright he rears from off the pool his mighty stature, on each hand the flames, driven backward, slope their pointing spires, and rolled in billows, leave in the midst a horrid veil. Then, with expanded wings, he steers his flight aloft, incumbent on the dusky air that felt unusual weight, till on dry land he lights. If it were land that ever burned with solid, as the lake with liquid fire, and such appeared in hue, as when the force of subterranean wind transports a hill torn from Polaris, or the shattered side of thundering Etna, whose combustible and fueled entrails, thence conceiving fire, sublimed with mineral fury, aid the winds, and leave a singed bottom, all involved with stench and smoke. Such resting, found the soul of unblessed feet. Him followed his next mate, both glorying to have scaped the Stygian flood as gods, and by their own recovered strength, not by the sufferance of supernal power. Is this the region, this the soil, the clime, said then the lost archangel, this the seat that we must change for heaven? this mournful gloom for that celestial light? Be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right. Farthest from him is best, whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells, Hail, horrors, hail, infernal world, and thou, profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. These are interesting lines. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What matter where? If I be still the same, and what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater, here at least 
we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here for his envy, will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice, to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. But wherefore let we then, our faithful friends, the associates and co-partners of our loss, lie thus astonished on the oblivious pool, and call them not to share with us their part in this unhappy mansion, or once more with rallied arms to try what may be yet regained in heaven, or what more lost in hell. Because you have to uh, write on it here um, um, at the, uh, uh, for the next writing assessment, I'm going to have you listen now to Francis Bacon's Of Marriage. So go ahead and find that one real quickly. Um, in our, in our last minutes here, we'll just do this one. This one is on page 459. Now what you gotta do in your writing assessment uh, for Monday is you gotta respond in a letter to Francis Bacon of five paragraphs, telling him whether you agree or disagree with his positions on marriage, all right? So follow that one real quickly. What did I say? 459. 459, all right, here we go. Of marriage and single life. Sir Francis Bacon. He that hath wife and children hath given hostages to fortune, for they are impediments to great enterprises, either of virtue or mischief. Certainly the best works, and of greatest merit for the public, have proceeded from the unmarried or childless men, which both in affection and means have married and endowed the public. Yet it were great reason that those that have children should have greatest care of future times, unto which they know they must transmit their dearest pledges. Some there are who, though they lead a single life, yet their thoughts do end with themselves and account future times impertinences. Nay, there are some other that account wife and children but as bills of charges. Nay, more... There are some foolish, rich, covetous men that take a pride in having no children, because they may be thought so much the richer. Or perhaps they have heard some talk. Such an one is a great rich man, and another accept to it. Yea, but he hath a great charge of children, as if it were an abatement to his riches. Kids make you poor. But the most ordinary <laughs> cause of a single life is liberty especially in certain self-pleasing and humorous minds, which are so sensible of every restraint, as they will go near to think their girdles and garters to be bonds and shackles. Unmarried men are best friends, best masters, best servants, but not always best subjects, for they are like to run away, and almost all fugitives are of that condition. A single life doth well with churchmen, for charity will hardly water the ground where it must first fill a pool. It is indifferent for judges and magistrates, for if they be facile and corrupt, you shall have a servant five times worse than a wife. For soldiers, I find the generals commonly in their hortatives put men in mind of their wives and children, and I think the despising of marriage amongst the Turks maketh the vulgar soldier more base. Certainly, wife and children are a kind of discipline of humanity, and single men, though they be many times more charitable because their means are less exhaust, yet, on the other side, they are more cruel and hard-hearted, good to make severe inquisitors, because their tenderness is not so oft called upon. Grave natures, led by custom, and therefore constant, are commonly loving husbands, as was said of Ulysses, Vetulum suum pretulit immortalitati. Chaste women are often proud and froward, as presuming upon the merit of their chastity. It is one of the best bonds, both of chastity and obedience, in the wife if she thinks her husband wise, which she will never do if she find him jealous. Wives are young men's mistresses, companions for middle age, and old men's nurses, so as a man may have a quarrel to marry when he will. 
But yet he was reputed one of the wise men that made answer to the question, when a man should marry. A young man, not yet. An elder man, not at all. It is often seen that bad husbands have very good wives, whether it be that it raiseth the price of their husband's kindness when it comes, or that the wives take a pride in their patience. But this never fails. If the bad husbands were of their own choosing, against their friend's consent, for then they will be sure to make good their own folly. All right, so you've got your readings now uh, to prep for the examination. And uh, 